Good morning, everyone. Uh, Jenna, could I see you for a second right after class? Just you're not in trouble. I just want to ask you. <laughs> um, I need about uh, six hours to get through material I want to share with you this morning. Uh, I thought of maybe drinking more caffeine and talking faster, but that would be against my religion. So we're just going to try and catch the high points and, and fill in as best we can. Start. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this magazine called The Greater Good. There's an institute in, the, in this building uh, – no, in Tolman Hall called the Center for Peace and Human Well-Being. And they produce this magazine called Greater Good. And they had an interview with Philip Gorevich who is talking about uh, genocides and talking about the uh, agonizing moral dilemma that people go through when something like Darfur is cooking up. In, in some cases, these are things that could have been fixed very easily. In the case of one of the worst, Rwanda, it all it would have taken would have been uh, for the U.S. to fly an airplane or over the country and jam uh, the uh, Radio Libre des Mille Collines, the Hutu radio station, which was inflaming the whole country. All you'd have to do is, you know, about 25 cents worth of aluminum foil. They could have jammed that, but they didn't do it. So we have this terrible dilemma. Are we going to intervene and get our helicopter shot down once again? Or are we going to you know, pretend nothing is happening? And of course, this is where nonviolence weighs in with a real alternative. And at one point in his interview, Gorevich said, so we have to confront the limits of our ability to marry our moral sense of pure common humanity to the amoral instruments of politics and force. Because he's unaware that you could marry your moral sense of pure common humanity to moral instruments of spiritual politics and persuasion. He doesn't know that. I'm not sharing this with you <coughs> to put him down but to give us a sense of how important the work is that we're doing here. So if people like that knew that there was an alternative, this world could change very quickly. Okay. Uh, so last time <coughs> we were discussing uh, some insights that were shared with one of the women in the Chilean uh, referendum movement. And I guess the question I'd like us to start off with is, what is the difference between anger and rage? And for the time – I hope nobody's experiencing either of them right now. But for the time being, I'm going to ask the uh, A students not to chime in because we touched on part of this. I've elaborated it. But we touched on part of this when we talked about the key episode that starts the whole nonviolent cycle going, kicks the wheel over, namely <coughs> when Gandhi is thrown off a train in Maritzburg, which uh, Richard Attenborough very wisely made into the opening scene of his movie, almost opening scene. So you guys just, you know, be patient, repeat your mantra for a couple of minutes and let's just ask the other folks before I call on you. What is the difference? Uh, I can say that anger might be like a temporary emotional state. Yeah. And rage to me it just like could be a drive. Very good. So you have anger is emotional. <coughs> And rage is a drive in the sense that – sorry. Michael, that isn't working very well. Here, use my umbrella. <laughs> Remember to give it back to me though. Is a, a drive. Mm. We assume that the word she used for rage is furia. Is that what she probably said? Furia? What do you think she might have used for anger? Enojo? I suppose that doesn't matter all that much, yeah. But it does show that these are common human experiences, that we experience these things as different and it's not just a quantitative difference as R.B. was pointing out. And then as I was thinking about this, I suddenly remembered that a graduate student of mine in classics did a dissertation on two Homeric words for anger. And in fact, they, it showed exactly this 
configuration. The two words were kolos and kotos, or And kolos is where this is where we get the word choleric. It's a nice archaic word, you English majors. Jenna, choleric comes from kolos. Uh, and it's a mood. You know, it comes and goes. Uh, the emphasis here is on the subjective transitory experience of the individual, not on the social impact. Whereas kotos is more long standing, it's, it's uh, more durable. But also it seems to be qualitatively on another plane of reality. For example, in the Greek world, the ancient Greek world, the gods have kotos. And human beings tend to have kolos. And when the gods have kotos, watch out. Because <laughs> that's going to make a difference in the world. Okay. So that's one thing. And uh, I think it's a very useful start. <coughs> so incidentally, A people, now you can tell us what – what it was – there's something else I think needs to be said, and you can chime in now. Uh, what makes that crucial difference between anger and rage? I was sitting in this lecture last night that Amy is going to tell us a little bit about on Tuesday, and I was thinking to myself, I'm hearing nothing but kolos. This is all enojo. I'm not hearing any furia. Nothing is going to be done uh, from all of this anger that I was hearing from these – Young people, which I could totally understand. I mean, if you're going to get angry at anybody, they have picked the right people and the right issues to get angry about. But you reach a point where you want to do something about it. And then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go back to that a little bit more on Tuesday. Okay. But what is the other difference now? You might remember uh, what I theorized made the, made the difference between a person just being ticked off you can substitute any other words that you wish because he was thrown off a train, which has happened a million times and unfortunately is going to go on happening. And someone who was so challenged and turned inside out by the experience that he changed modern civilization. And what was it that you remember that I proposed probably made the difference? The, yeah, Michael? Yeah. Excellent. That's, that's the real thing. Uh, I mean, this is also real. It's all real. But this is the thing I, <laughs> I was getting at here. In anger, you take it personally and you give it personally. <coughs> you take it in – this is being, how could they do this to me? And you dish it out at the persons who did it to you. And that's exactly what I was hearing last night, even though the People and the speakers in this group weren't themselves victimized. They were enraged about the victimization of others and they wanted to get at the individuals who were doing it. Okay, so now this is going to be a little bit difficult, a little bit harder, but what, uh, what's the object in the case of rage? Well, if you're not taking it personally, what do you do? Yes, Alex. It's aimed at the system, right. You are looking for systemic change and it is going to galvanize energies out of you. In fact, you <coughs> notice that the very next thing – this is the, this is the second stage here – the very next thing that that woman said was <coughs> after she said, I wasn't angry, I felt a rage, the very next thing she said was, and when you feel a rage like that, you have to do something about it. So this is more likely to express itself in action and it's much, much more likely to express itself in positive action. That is action which is going to make a positive difference. You may have to say, you know, down with this system and may look deconstructive – I'm using a scholarly word to avoid facing a moral problem here. You're deconstructing something that's harmful. In fact, uh, let me interrupt myself here for a second because you're used to this by now. Uh, we were – remember we were talking last time about – oh, that's right. Matthias isn't here. We were talking last time about concealment and we were saying that uh, one of these people in Santiago 
with saying this was a clandestine movement. It had to be because you stick your head out, you'd be cut off right away. And so we got onto the whole question of truth and lying and stuff like that in nonviolence and in, in Pax 164A, <coughs> we just rule it out. No lying, no, no untruth. We're just all going to be squeaky clean here because uh, we'll never get elected, <laughs> but, uh, but we might get saved. But now we grow up and this is Pax 164B and we're in the real world and we have to realize that <coughs> if you, let's say, get a, an idea that you want to, let's say, overthrow the United States government by force and uh, you rush out on the plaza and say, you know, I'm going to do this and buy yourself some weapons and stuff. You'll just be taken out immediately. Practically, it doesn't make any sense. So what they often say, they being in this case the people who promote uh, strategic nonviolence, we're going to talk about them in particular next week, if I ever get through this week. And what they say is wait until you have enough strength to go public. You don't go public when you're just an isolated individual with a weird and offensive project here or there. So that on the practical level, that's how it works. But I'm concerned to try to bring the practical and the ethical or the, you know, the theory or the model in line. And there's an interesting comment that was made by a German Catholic priest who – resisted uh, Hitler throughout World War II in the sense that he was arranging rescues for people, the kinds of people that Hitler wanted to kill. And he was asked at the end of the war, you know, okay, this is wonderful stuff that you did, don't get me wrong, but look, you're a Catholic priest and you're not supposed to lie. I guess that's true of Catholic priests. Uh, and here you were telling the Gestapo you weren't hiding people when you had four or five people up in your closet. What do you have to say about that? And he said something very interesting and I'm kind of drawn to it. It sounds like it might be a cop-out but it might also be useful for us. He said, look, the whole system was a lie. So to just go out and speak within that system, even if you said something that was factually correct, it would not be the truth. Because the people that he was speaking to, their heads were screwed on so backwards that you had to give a little backwards talk to get a hold of them and screw it back on straight. So where the whole regime is a lie, sometimes you know, just going around playing along with that regime and hiding people, not you know, uh, giving people up is not the best idea. Having said that, <coughs> and I'm not sure I could repeat what I just said, so I hope you got it down. <laughs> but having said that, to take another extreme, there is this incident which I mentioned in my book and which I mentioned last semester of this attack on a village in uh, Gujarat where it was an enraged mob uh, more or less supported by the government which is Hindu, uh, quote unquote, Hindu in the sectarian sense, not in the spiritual sense, going up to these huts where women were hiding their Muslim neighbors under their altar in the house and saying to the women, we think you're hiding a Muslim in there. And in every single case, this was going on in ten villages. The woman who was standing there against this enraged mob with all the gas canisters and everything, they said, yes, I am. And then the mob said, well, we want him out of there. And they said, the women said, first kill me, then you may enter. And in every single case, those men turned around and went away. So there is a tremendous amount of power in truth. You know, this is the core of integrative power. But at the same time, when it's, uh, there may be occasions when the whole system is so out of whack that to tell something that's factually correct is not really the truth. Okay? As, as don't tell any philosophy professors in Moses Hall that I said this because they may not <laughs> let, get, let me get away with it. But it's like Gandhi was once asked well, – he once said, you must always tell the truth but never an unkind one. In other words, kindness itself is a kind of truth which is deeper and more important than factuality. Okay, now um, there was some direct tie-in here to <laughs> what I, where I stopped and interrupted myself. I knew that was dangerous. Um, I don't see exactly what the, what the tie-in is at the moment, but 
there's another emotional or whatever you want to call it, psychic, spiritual factor that this same woman mentioned. Uh, say, I think it was she who said oh, uh, it wasn't uh, anger, it was rage. The rage drives you into action against the system and then what happens? Suddenly she discovers she's out there. <laughs> well, certainly it will do that, but I'm just focusing still on what's going on inside the person, inside this one person. And she made this comment, yeah? Uh, says no, more fear. no more fear. Right. And now you might say that there's a kind of non fear that has to come in even in the very beginning. I don't know that, you know, it doesn't make that. Much it's not that that's going to make that much difference, but the fact is that uh, when we you look at what people have done in nonviolent actions and the courage that has sometimes been displayed by absolutely ordinary people is mind-boggling. And you look at it and you say, "My God, I could never do that," but you're just a person like them, and you could get swept up in the same kind of situation. I'm thinking of Andy Young, for example, who was beaten unconscious when they were trying to walk up a street somewhere. I think it was in Alabama. I'm not sure. He was literally beaten unconscious and the minute he came to, he said, let's go. Where are they? And he went back into this group and went right back and confronted the same people who had just beat him. You heard them breaking bottles, so you knew what they were going to do with that. I can't imagine how he had the courage to do that. Or to be more honest, I can't imagine myself doing that. And at the last minute, the sheriff came in and got in between them, performed a, a third party, not really nonviolent intervention, <laughs> and said, let him go. And off, off they went. But um, I think this is a clue that once you are engaged in action, you feel a lot less fear. And I have a quote from a friend of mine in my book uh, saying that. She was down in uh, Nicaragua during the Contra era. And, you know, we asked her, Wasn't, weren't you afraid? She said, when I was sitting here in Marin County drinking lattes, I was terrified. But once I got down there and started working, I wasn't afraid anymore. I felt like I was doing what I was supposed to do. By the way, and this really is just a brief interruption, but speaking of drinking lattes, uh, Arby and I were sharing one in the Free Speech Movement Cafe a moment ago, and I think I saw my picture. I, I think <laughs> I found myself. So we'll have a, uh, uh, an outing. Sometime we'll all go there with a yellow backlighter and <laughs> circle. Okay, I knew all those la lattes would finally work. Um, Okay, so uh, I want to say just one more thing about the psychological dynamics of what's going on within person power when a person becomes a nonviolent actor. And that is when you're faced with anger and it's getting deeper, one way to think about it is it can deepen to hatred. But it's still – that's just taking – it's just quantitatively different, right? You're, you're still taking it personally. But you're intensifying that personal grudge both I subjectively and objectively. You, know, you hate the person. And that can last for a long time. So you can deepen anger so that it lasts for centuries by making it into hatred. But the, uh, the rage thing is this other pathway that we're talking about. And having said this about anger, we might go back – I don't have time to do it right now. We might go back and think about what happens to fear and what happens to greed. Those are the big three that are, when converted, become the dynamic motive energy for nonviolence. Do you have a question, Lisa? Okay. All right. So now, as I said last time, I, uh, I'm fully sympathetic with those of you who are having trouble getting through the reading. And I think what I'd like to do now is uh, go over it myself. And there is a lot, incidentally. I noticed that. And I thought maybe if I pick out some things of significance in the reading. It'll help give you a uh, sense of how to do the reading. So it's not just another – one more paragraph with more names and facts and things like that. Um, 
There was an important organization that got cited several times in the course of describing the uh, Chile uh, insurrection. So I, this is something I'd like you to know about and that is SERPA. It stands for Servicio Paz y Justicia. Did I get that right, Sam? Pretty good. And it's uh, important because it's a long-standing organization, which is not always the case in uh, the progressive movement or whatever we want to call it. Things tend to come and go. We have to reinvent the wheel. So maybe one of the biggest problems in peace development long-term for the last 50 years has been lacks of continuity. So the fact that you have an organization like FOR in Europe and North America and you have an organization like SERPA in Latin America uh, and those organizations can hang on and not just lurch from crisis to crisis but build up some repertoires, identify people and do trainings and so on and so forth. It's extremely helpful when, when a, a problem comes up. So the other – it's not just the time dimension for SERPA but also the fact that uh, they operate all over Latin America. One of the people who started it um, was actually <coughs> tortured in, uh, in uh, Argentina. So it's – it's got a lot of this kind of energy <laughs> behind it. Okay. Um, so to talk about the EDSA rebellion for a second and then the rest of what I'm going to say will go page by page in, in the blue book, okay? A couple of things I wanted to cite uh, from the movie and the readings that you've done. The whole thing came to a climax in February of 1986 and that climax lasted only four days. So you have a problem which in a way goes back to 1902 when a certain large North American country – I'm not going to name any countries because I don't want anyone to take this personally – but it fought a war with Spain uh, and then took over the Philippines and uh, it's a very anguishing personal issue for me because my grandfather was actually part of that expedition. They crushed an indigenous rebellion by the Moro people. In the, I think it was in the area of Mindanao. And one of the results of this that, of course, the documentary didn't talk about is that the Philippines are experiencing really heavy violence, <coughs> this, uh, dissension to this day. In fact, uh, it's more complicated than the film even made out because the film you had the government, the people and then with their nonviolent uprising and the guerrillas in the mountains. But there's also – horrible stuff going on in the South between Muslims and Christians and then there's stuff between indigenous people and more citified people. All this is going on and it's the second a field of operation that nonviolent peace force is going to go into. The first one was Sri Lanka and you'll hear about that from David Hartso because he'll be coming back from three weeks in Sri Lanka in a little while. But the next cases that they're working on are Mindanao and uh, northern Uganda. But anyway, um, this, this problem had been going on you know, probably in a sense from times immemorial but in this particular political form at least since the beginning of the 20th century. So this is almost 100 years and it was over in four days. This doesn't mean that the nonviolent uprising was only four days long because you know that there were these Catholic base communities. There's Hildegard Gossmeyer was in there. I want to say another thing about her in just a second. But we have a name for these climaxes and it's useful to have names for things when you're trying to describe a field and nobody is quite sure what it is. And this phenomenon is called – I'm sure you A people are very familiar with it – nonviolent moment. It's also the name of a DVD that you're going to be seeing later on the semester starring some friends of yours. But this – the concept here is that you have – okay, let's think in terms of two forces that are in opposition, the people and the state in this case. And they're jockeying and they're, they're constantly reconfiguring their 
power structure, their power relationship. It's, it's like a conversation, as I've often pointed out, which is like shifting back and forth. And what you hope will happen is that will come to a real head-to-head -head confrontation where their strength and your strength will be very clear and just pitted directly against one another. And you want that to happen because you believe, having had Pax 164, that nonviolent power is going to prevail in these situations. So the reason it doesn't is that there's some unclarity there. Some of the legitimacy that should have been on our side is going to the other side or something like that. So you actually try sometimes consciously to jockey things so that you're going to have a confrontation on favorable terms to yourself. And that's exactly what happened in the EDSA uprising. It was like most of them, it was partly planned and partly unplanned. You really have to be ready to take advantage of opportunities when they come up. But the nonviolent moment is useful for us because it shows very clearly what those two forces were, who was on which side and what they actually had going for them. Okay? So, um, now a couple of other things while we're thinking about the Philippines. Uh, at toward the end of the documentary, there was this bishop up in the hills, in the mountains, who said that th what they were trying to do was turn their powerlessness into a kind of strength. And, okay, we would put that a little differently because we – I keep including you in my mental world <laughs> – but just wait – put up with this until the final exam. Then you can believe whatever you want. But right now, we're all on the same page. Uh, we believe that nonviolence is, in fact, a realer power than violence. And in reality, violence is a negation of nonviolence, not the other way around. However, most people in the world that we live in are absolutely not aware of nonviolence, as Mr. Gurevich gives us to understand. So, in fact, in practice, what you often are doing is – I hate to use the word exploiting, but there it goes – you're exploiting vulnerability. You're, you're like <coughs> the – you're letting your vulnerability challenge the awareness, the humane awareness of your opponent. And if you're, if you're not vulnerable, if you have weapons or you're threatening or something like that, that simply won't happen. It'll be t two examples of the same kind of power and then it'll just be a question of degree. <coughs> If they've got more of it, you'll lose. But what – through this route of, of using, acknowledging your apparent vulnerability, your powerlessness as an appeal, you're invoking an entirely different kind of power. Okay. One more thing I want to say about EDSA and then I'll, I'll get into the book. Um, and that is we talked about the importance of Hildegard Gossmeyer as a – skillfully done intervention where you have something that these people need. And so you're not going to be such an ideologue that you're going to say, oh, you know, I come from Western Europe. I speak an Indo-European language, so I'm going to downgrade myself and I can't teach an indigenous person anything. You know, uh, that's, I think, an extreme and an error. The other extreme is peace imperialism where you say, you know, these people are off-white in their skin color. Therefore, they don't know anything, so we've got to go in and fix them. That's also very undesirable and very ineffective, counterproductive. But you go in and say, I have some stuff that might help you. Let's see how we can you know, get it together. Elicit the capacities that you have and I will help you develop them because I have had the leisure – to study nonviolence my whole life. And you've been on Mount Smoky trying to get a pair of busted old waraches out of there so you can sell them in the market and maybe get one meal for your kid. So that's what we were mainly talking about in her connection. But there's another point to be made and that is that sometimes your intervener – and she was a good example of this – can provide a connection to the international community. And this brings us to another wonderful concept that was formulated by uh, Johann Galtung. He was a great wordsmith, 
Johann Galtung is. We really owe him a lot of this vocabulary. He calls this the great chain of nonviolence. And we're going to see some examples of this in the reading. So, of course, he's thinking about the great chain of being, which is a you know, medieval theological concept and he's playing off of that. But let's think for a minute about Martin Luther King, Jr. There he is. You know, the people that he's working for are like domestic servants or, you know, laborers, things like that. There's not a way in the world that they could talk to the President of the United States. That's, the, that's how the world is going, right? I mean, I can remember when – like when I wanted to start peace and conflict studies, I called the chancellor. I said, uh, hey, Mike. I said, no. <laughs> but, we, you know, we were pretty chummy. I said, I got an idea I want to talk to you about. He said, okay, come to the faculty club. Let's, uh, let's have some beer and talk about it. That seemed to be the, the essentials for having a conversation with the chancellor. It was as you said, you had to knock back about three beers before the conversation got serious. Well, okay, in the present instance, that conversation went nowhere. I, you know, I got a little tipsy, but uh, otherwise I got nothing out of this. Um, but the fact is I could talk to him and now that's just about impossible. You know, a line – an ordinary line professor, I cannot call the chancellor even though I can pronounce his name pretty well. And say, you know, let's go to the club and knock back a few Heinekens. I've got a scheme to talk to you about. No, I don't think so. So there is a question, a problem of access. And uh, we're going to see – you've already seen, I guess, in some of the readings that very successful nonviolent movements come from both above and below. And that happened in the Eastern Europe in the so former Soviet bloc a lot. But how is that communication going to be effective? Because an average housewife cannot talk to the powers that be. But there a friendship very often sprang up in the South between the domestic workers and the white women that they were working for. There's a certain bond of understanding that they had with both women trying to run this household. They often ended up friends and that was very important. You're going to see a clip from a film called The Long Walk Home which can show you the political result of that kind of friendship on the one-to-one -one level. And uh, if you were to see the whole film, A Long Walk Home, you'll see there's a moment when her domestic servant, played by Whoopi Goldberg, is harassed by the police. So Whoopi Goldberg's uh, uh, employer just gets on the phone and talks to the sheriff like I used to talk to the chancellor. And they bring the policeman into the house and he has to apologize to that woman. So although the oppressed – people have no direct access to people on the top of the power hierarchy, they can have indirect access. And that can be stage by stage by stage by stage until you get somebody like Martin Luther King Jr. who can actually walk into the Oval Office and uh, sing a few choruses of We Shall Overcome and <laughs> get some legislation passed. So on the international level, having someone like Hildegard Gossmeyer in the Philippines was important for that also because she was able to alert the, the peace community in the whole global north that stuff like this was going on in the Philippines and get them some representation. Uh, theoretically, if this had gone on, she could even have gotten through to the then President of the United States. I forget his name. He the one who, who's the screen actor, you know, the one with the chimpanzee. I keep forgetting his name. Uh, but he actually called Marcos on one point and said, don't fire on that crowd. That was very useful. He played a useful role there. Um, okay, so that's the concept I wanted to help you pull out of the reading. And now let's go to um, the book and – I'm going right back to the Iranian Revolution for a bit and let's see. I'm on page 45, the middle paragraph. Just You can just jot down these numbers if you didn't bring the book with you. This is the book I'm talking about again, Nonviolent Social Revolutions. We might get one of the editors over here. He just teaches in San Francisco. We have a collection and get Bart Fair together. He'll probably come over and talk to us. Uh, the mobilization of the masses by clandestinely smuggled audio cassette tapes 
Remember, this is the uh, middle 70s. Audio cassette tapes are pretty high tech. They're pretty snazzy stuff. This is the – think iPods, okay, <laughs> or whatever is coming next. I, I don't know. The mobilization of the masses by clandestinely smuggled audio cassette tapes led Abdul Hassan Sadeh, an official with the Ministry of National Gu Guidance, to note that, quote, tape cassettes are stronger than fighter planes. This, this is nice because, again, uh, nonviolence is a different kind of power. It doesn't need a whole lot of armor and metal around it. There's I remember one of the peace movements in Germany in the 80s. Somebody was – there was a big demonstration. There's a picture of a dinosaur on it. And the slogan was, ausgestorben, zu viel Panzer, zu wenig Hirn, <laughs> which means extinct, too much armor, too little brain. <laughs> so the kind of power that nonviolence likes to use is softer, softer power. Costs a lot less, hurts a lot less, but we shouldn't think that it's less strong for that. And this is where forces of repression are often vulnerable. Not always, but they can often be vulnerable because they don't realize the power of ideas, or concepts. They think just have bigger whips and bigger tanks and stuff like that and more Abu Ghraibs and Guantanamos and everything will be fine. But as Gandhi said, there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. So I said that sometimes a weakness of theirs, there are some regimes that are so clever that in fact uh, they outmaneuver the progressive forces with their manipulation of ideas. In fact, I think that's what's going on in our world today. Uh, and it's, it's because we have this massive commercial culture that's working against us. But we'll talk about that repeatedly <laughs> and at greater length under other circumstances. But that's an important thing to note that in Chile and in Iran and in uh, Poland and other parts of the Soviet bloc, the regime didn't realize that access to media could be that important. And then they quickly lost legitimacy when people were able to you know, work through all of their lies and propaganda and get some better ideas in people's heads. Now, uh, mostly this uprising, <coughs> the Iranian uprising, and I checked this out with my next door neighbor, Dariush Zahedi. It's very nice to <laughs> work in <laughs> international and area studies. You just got most of the world is right down that corridor there. Uh, so, and Dariush said that in fact, yes, this was almost entirely a nonviolent uprising, non-dash violent – he didn't say that, but I'm saying this – non-dash violent uprising in the sense not that the people were trying to love the Shah, that would be very hard to do, but uh, that they were not going to use abusive, injurious force in their movement. However, as the chapter points out, there were a couple of uh, episodes in which – and that's – Hang on a second. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm not finding it right away. But there were episodes. There were, were episodes of violence and very extreme violence. And this is a pro problem that has plagued us to the present day. Uh, the the Nagler's Law uh, issue. And I think what I'll do in the interest of time is leave it with you as a question. And there are going to be three or four questions like this, okay? If you were inventing the peace movement today, how would you deal with the problem of unconverted participants who, though small in number, can be so tremendously damaging? It uh, – for one of the early cases, the, the Ruhrkampf, the battle for the Ruhr, uh, almost entirely nonviolent, but a few people uh, <coughs> fired a few shots threw these wooden shoes <laughs> in a sabotage. Or sabot is a wooden shoe. 
And then the police were able to crack down immediately. And the suspicion is that those were not protesters, <coughs> but agents provocateurs, as they call it, people who were infiltrated, who infiltrated from the military and from the police to get them to throw stones. So the problem is twofold. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to try and take a few minutes at the end of this class today so you can hear from Arby and on Tuesday from Amy about how they've been facing this issue right now. Uh, people who are outraged about the right thing, don't get me wrong, but they don't know how to turn their anger away from bitterness. That's another useful word, by the way, that came up last semester in that documentary, A Time for Justice. Keep out the, the bitterness element which turns it into a personal vendetta. So how are we going to deal with people <coughs> – and when the time comes that we need numbers, how are we going to mobilize numbers and make sure that there won't be somebody or somebody's in the group that's blowing it? And then, of course, there's the question of outsiders coming in and doing that deliberately because they're a little smarter than us. And if they know that a little violence <coughs> will mess us up completely. In fact, another episode where that happened most probably was a, there was a student strike at Columbia University in the 70s. A strike went on for 24 hours and there was – in those 24 hours, there was one moment of – I guess we can call it violence. It was disruption, you know, throwing stuff, cursing, stuff like that. So you have 23 hours and 59 minutes of nonviolence and one minute of violence. And the media coverage that night in all the New York uh, major television channels, they allotted – they said, we'll give it one minute. So what do you think they did? Obviously, they took the one minute where there was violence happening. And it later turned out that that wasn't even students. It was somebody who came in from the outside. Okay? So keep that question in your mind now. How are we going to deal with this? And uh, let's see. One, two, three. Yeah. Bottom of page 45, once in power, the Islamic regime proved to abandon its nonviolent methodology, particularly in the period after its dramatic <coughs> shift to the right in the spring of 1981. And my colleague, Professor Zahedi, said that this was actually the Ayatollah's plan all along and he had been lying to the people and getting them to lay down their lives and sacrifice. You know, it must be our blood, not theirs, all of this stuff. Uh, just fully intending to be as repressive as the Shah had been all along. So this is another question for us. How are we going to fix this recurrent problem that when a nonviolent – we're thinking now of insurrections, but it could apply to reform movements also. When a nonviolent insurrection is successful, power goes to the head and people tend to forget what gave them their success and they jump off the train as Gandhi said. You know, we were heading for Rishikesh. They jumped off at uh, Delhi and uh, unfortunately, you just cycle back. All you end up doing in this case is reorganizing power, not mobilizing a different kind of power. So you, re you remember my famous – Slogan, which is going to – I'm sure is going to be a very successful bumper sticker someday. It's not about a different kind of people in power. It's about a different kind of power in people. Okay. So think about that also. These are questions that are quite real. I mean, if we come up with answers to these questions, as you're going to hear very shortly, we can pump these answers directly into the peace movements. This is not just for you to write papers and uh, amuse me on the final exam. This could be extremely useful, both of these questions. Okay. So now I'm turning my attention to the first intifada uh, again, which was, as we said, a success. It was similar to the problem that we were just talking about, a success which was not capitalized on. And what happened there? What happened was people – carried out this uprising to the point where they got a seat at the negotiating table and then they decided, okay, we have won and they went back to their same old, same old and let the negotiators take it uh, forward from there. And unfortunately, they were – the negotiators were not very successful in Madrid in 1991 
and almost none of the concessions that had been forced out of the Israelis by the nonviolent intifada stuck. Here's a very sad example of the same thing. It's the Prague Spring <coughs> uprising of 1968. It was brilliant. Um, the we're going we're to be talking about that in detail in just a bit. But uh, in again, it was kind of a nonviolent moment. It just, you know, in a couple of weeks, they had really brought the country to a standstill. They had kept the, the Warsaw Pact armies at bay. And then what happened was the, so the uh, Kremlin invited the leaders to Moscow for a discussion. Discussion, Russian style. <laughs> By the time they came back to Czech, well, even before they got back to Czechoslovakia, they got to the airport and found that one of their men had not who wasn't with them, because the Russians were taking him to prison. And they sat there on the airport and said, "We're not going back without him." And eventually, he had to be released. So that was a good thing. Uh, that was using nonviolence correctly. Uh, you risk yourself to maintain solidarity with the threatened other, but. The fact is that they were jawboned into basically selling out the revolution in Frankfurt. Not to put too fine a face on it, that's what they had to do. So here they get up in Wenceslas Square and they stand there. Uh, Dubček himself was just shedding tears copiously and they said, here's how it's going to be. And basically it's at that point that the revolution lost its, uh, its fermesa permanente. And uh, ultimately, it was overcome. So, yeah, Michael? Well, how did that happen? Well, I imagine they sat around the table and uh, the, the Soviets told them, you know, if you keep this up, this is what we're going to do. And they threatened them and they cajoled them and they jawboned them into accepting some kind of concessions, which when you're in that environment, it seems like, okay, it's a good idea. But then when you go back and face your people, you realize what you've done. You really sold it out. So if you guys can stand it, I want to leave that as an open question also. How – I mean maybe at the end of the semester we should design the ideal nonviolent insurrection and, uh, you know, blueprint it and sell it or <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Give the money to Meta or something like that. But uh, it's, a, it's an interesting – question which is partly strategic and partly principle. That, that's what I think is useful for us. How are we going to prevent this kind of thing from happening? <coughs> Where a movement gets uh, handed up the great chain of non-being and it – oh, sorry. <laughs> the great chain of non-violence and when it gets to the top, people think, okay, that's what we were after. We won. You go, you go and relax. And it turns out that those people are not in a position to carry forward with your ideas. Okay. Um, I want to draw your attention to two things that are on page 47, 47 paragraph 2. 47.2 is the way I do it. If you must be real fast. Um, the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence documented this uprising and that's the organization that was started by Mubarak Awad, uh, someone I'm very proud to call my friend and who has often spoken in this class. And we talked about how he started that thing. And many of the tactics of the Intifada were not new, but they brought this form of struggle to new heights in terms of its scope and role as a calculated strategy of resistance. That's the end of paragraph two. So remember some of you when we were talking about Gandhi's tactics that really it's, it might be true to say – I'm not sure I haven't actually thought this through. Maybe you can help me on this. But I think it might be true to say that not a single tactic that he did was new. They either came from the spiritual tradition like fasting and stuff like that or they came from a kind of indigenous political uh, can canniness that was common in Indian villages. 
And in fact, one scholar, uh, Joan Bondurant, who wrote one of the really early books about nonviolence, is called uh, Conquest of Violence. She actually taught here for a while. If she was still teaching here, I would be a lot less uh, sassy when I talk <laughs> about Barrows Hall. But, you know, there you go. Anyway, in her book, she did a repertoire, a listing of where all these things came from that Gandhi used. I mean, you think khadi, okay, you know, homespun cotton, that's truly Gandhian. No, but as a matter of fact, they were wearing khadi in the early years of the Amer All Indian Congress, long, you know, somewhat before Gandhi was born. Okay? So these things are simmering in the population. And again, this is partly the role of an outsider to come in and say, look, you've got this, this, and this that you can use. But what makes them now new and effective is that they're pulled together by someone who has a strategic overview and can say, now use this one, now use that one. That's the great advantage. Is you know, someone who knows that you do constructive program whenever you can and you do obstructive program when you must and he knows how to pull them in and you know, put in the appropriate form, that's what makes these things incredibly powerful. Now, on the bottom of the page, uh, next to last paragraph, Nafez Asaili, who took over the center from Mubarak. And also, I can't resist saying this, also a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you for indulging me in these little things. Uh, as Nafez Asaili of the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence described the situation in 1989, he said, quote, in, he's talking about the Israelis. In 1967, they defeated the armies of three countries in six days, but they have yet to defeat the Intifada. That's extremely useful for us because we're looking for ways of showing comparative advantage of nonviolent power versus violent power. Okay? You remember my uh, quoting probably from Martin Luther King that there were – Less people were killed in s ten years of civil rights movement in the South than were killed in six days of rioting in Detroit. Okay. So that, that's one way of looking at it. And we talked about the comparison between the Indian freedom struggle and the Algerian freedom struggle. Many, many, many more people were killed and the outcome was horrendously wrong. But what uh, – oh, yeah, that's right. There is another very good example. The first major campaign that Gandhi did in India, which is Champaran, he came back, was an issue that they had been struggling for for a hundred years. And he got more done in three months than they had been able to do in a hundred years by mobilizing nonviolence. I'm telling you this partly because a Amy and others have been coming and saying that they've been having these discussions with people and these people are always saying nonviolence doesn't work in one form or another. And then you start telling them how it did work and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> Doesn't always mean they're going to say, oh, I understand, thank you. But, <laughs> but it'll get in there somewhere. Yeah. W in the early days of peace and conflict studies, we uh, were hearing a talk by w a member of the military affairs program. I, I reach out. I mean, I'll, I'll even hear from Stanford people if they want to talk here. And he was saying, well, as you know, in history it's been wars all the way down. It's been nothing but wars. And I said, oh, really? Uh, what about the, uh, the uh, Kyrgyz culture and uh, this new stuff has been coming out from uh, this woman? In, uh, and I just started to show him that for 6,000 years there was a culture called Old European where there were no – they had basically no militarism. There was no sign of weapons in any of their burial sites. And no sign that there was any armed conflict and they were perfectly happy for six, about 6,000 years until Indo-Europeans types like you, like me and some of you started coming in from the, from the Caucasus. And the minute I started saying those things, he changed the subject. So that, that's going to happen sometimes. You're not going to – it's not like you're going to get a lot of satisfaction out of this, but you will be changing things. Um, on page 57, there's an observation uh, by Suad Ajami. 
uh, she said that women's increased activism during the Intifada earned them the wrath of some of the extremist religious groups who tended to blame Palestinian defeats on the departure from tradition and religion. Okay, three things I want to say about this. Uh, the power of vulnerability and Gandhi said this a long time ago that anybody can do nonviolence but women are particularly good at it. Okay, I am not – I'm not a – I don't think of myself as either a sexist or an anti-sexist, I guess a sexist or a feminist in the essentialist sense. But for whatever reason, it seems to be the case that introducing women as a group into a movement – and we studied this in 1913 in South Africa – is more than just a quantitative difference. Not just like you have the whole human race instead of half the human race <coughs> involved, but you have a different kind of energy involved and a different kind of mentality. And there's a very nice book called um, Maternal Thinking. Uh, uh, by Hannah – somebody – I have a lot of Hannahs going through my head and this is, I'm not coming up with the right one. It'll, it'll come back to me. But it's maternal thinking and that now, now that we've got Google, you don't need to remember the author or the publisher or any of that stuff. She's, she's very good on exactly what that mentality is. But it also <coughs> brings up the point that – I think this is really – this is really fundamental – that when you decide to use nonviolence, you often find yourself fixing things that you didn't even set out to address. You didn't even maybe realize that they were a problem. Okay? So what's going on in this case? The women are joining the movement. Why? Because most of the men are in jail, because they're more easily picked off when there's a demonstration. Uh, and with what they want is they want to liberate Palestine. But they don't realize that they're liberating it socially as well by bringing women into a more humane situation in that society. I, I, I really, really like this point. So I, I hope you're enjoying it also. I, I think <coughs> that if once you make that one right decision – and you might think this is just a question of means. And if it's only a strategic question, it means it won't have this effect. But once you gravitate towards this notion, this feeling that nonviolence is, is going to be the way you want to be as a human being – remember it's Philippine style, we do it because we're Polish, all of that stuff – once you start doing that, you may or may not get what you're trying to get, but you're going to get some other stuff that you didn't even think about along the way. You may get what you're trying to get, but you, you will also tend to be working on – here, let's put it this way. Once you decide that you're going to use nonviolence, you'll find that you're working on many different manifestations of violence simultaneously. Okay, it's good to just be consciously aware of that. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next thing I want to – Side is just a little bit further on in that page, the uh, paragraph 3. So this is 57.3. I, re I realize that this is a little bit tedious, but I'm hoping that it's going to help you go through the readings and pull out stuff like this. Um, the roots of the organization of the Intifada can be traced directly to the creation and expansion of grassroots committees since the mid-1970s. And this is – we saw this with the base communities in the Philippines and th this also existed throughout Central America, throughout Latin America. And I'm going to kind of hint that this might be an answer to one of the problems that we were discussing. What happens when the leadership is untrustworthy, gets pulled off base by threats and so forth, that I am not one who thinks that – Everything has to come from the grassroots and there should be no organizational structure at all. There should be no room for people with specific kinds of expertise. 
I'm not saying that, but this was an extreme that people sometimes drifted into, particularly <coughs> in Germany where they had uh, – Germany and Spain where there had been rather serious problems with authoritarianism. People tended to go in the other direction and say, we want to have no authority whatsoever. This has all got to come from basis democratie, you know, dem democracy from the bottom. So while at the one hand I'm not saying we should go to that extreme, I think that for durability it has almost always been the case that small grassroots communities – we're talking about grassroots committees in Palestine, base communities throughout the – basically the, the, the Christian parts of the Global South really. And what would be the equivalent in our own dearly beloved student peace movement of today? When you go out to uh, – let's say somebody says, let's go up to Seattle and overthrow globalism, uh, what do people do in terms of association? Yeah. Well, it could be within universities or it could be not. But here's what I'm getting at. When you get there on the ground – okay, Seattle is a very dramatic case of this. Because I'm not sure of the numbers, but it's something like 50,000 people turned up there. Now that's more people that are PAX majors on UC Berkeley. So you know that not all of them were UC Berkeley PAX majors. So when you get there, you have a few very <coughs> charismatic individuals like Medea Benjamin from Global Exchange and others, but they don't want to take a role of leadership. So what do people do? You Who's going to tell 50,000 people who's going to go where and do what? What did they start? Another side? Uh, right. What kind of groups did you say? Affinity, Affinity groups. groups. Right. Exactly. That's, that's our equivalent. So that's our version of these micro communities that are pulled together for a particular purpose in an emergency. but. Uh, it turns out to be a very effective and a very efficient way of organizing people without going into a hierarchical pyramid. Yeah. So call it what you will and the, you know, in, the, in the base communities, which incidentally have now been imitated and I don't think they'd be angry at me for saying that. They're being imitated by Buddhists. So you have Buddhist base communities. There are 4,200 people in taking part in something like – Oh, I forget how many Buddhist-based communities now studying nonviolence, hopefully buying my book. <laughs> and actually Meta is working with them. So, okay, that's, a, that's, that's very helpful in um, organization. Now, uh, we talked about the stone throwing and how it has two different ways of being interpreted, either defiance or an actual attempt to hurt and it's, it's a gray area. Over time, overt demonstrations and stone-throwing confrontations gradually receded in the occupied territories. So if you just read that one sentence, you might think, uh-oh, they're winding down. They don't have Shabab throwing stones and they don't have demonstrations and the movement is disappearing. But – hang on, one more sentence now. This did not, however, signal an end to the <coughs> uprising and restructuring within the Palestinian community proceeded behind the scenes. What, what do we want to call that? What's my favorite term that I keep using ad infinitum ad nauseam over and over again? Starts with a C. Constructive program, thank you. Yeah. So th this was the beginning of constructive program for the Palestinian Intifada. Um, now on page 59. Paragraph 3, the Intifada proved to be a double-edged sword, strengthening and transforming the Palestinian community in the service of the national cause once was to some extent outweighed by the degree of violence and repression to which Palestinians were subjected. As the Intifada wore on, this population became increasingly weary and demoralized. We talked about that a little bit on Tuesday. And now here's a part that we didn't talk about on Tuesday. 
weary and demoralized and anxiously awaited some measure of hope from abroad. Okay, so we're, we're getting into a balance thing again where there's a right way and a wrong way to bring in uh, interventions from outside the community. And we've been talking earlier on today about the right way, how bringing Hildegard Gosmeyer came in there as a Catholic so she could relate directly to one of the communities on the ground and all the wonderful stuff that she was able to bring in. And basically, in realistic terms, it's almost impossible for an insurrection to survive without that kind of thing today. Though we're working on different ways of getting the information out, but so far movements that have been ignored have not succeeded. But on the other hand, yeah, Matthias? Well, in the first intifada, not – here's why I'm hesitating. <laughs> I'm hesitating because I don't know whether to call Mubarak Awad outsider or not. He's born in Palestine, uh, educated in the U.S., goes back, you know, with a Ph.D. in psychology from here. So he's like a perfect example, really. He's indigenous, but he has access to outside support. Out, but beyond Mubarak, I think in the first intifada, no. And I, it's interesting that now this, this present intifada has much more outside support through groups like the International Solidarity Movement and so forth. However, darn it. They're not as committed to nonviolence as the first intifada was. So it's very frustrating. You see a lot of these examples of people getting it partly right. I mean, I have this piece right, but that, pe that piece wrong. And that's where we really need some kind of strategic <coughs> overview. So with that qualification, I would say basically no, the Palestinian intifada did not only didn't have international community support – well, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm sorry. By virtue of the fact that they were nonviolent, they started to get a lot more appreciation and they started to change the image of what the Islamic world is like in the international community. And that did lead to Madrid and the Oslo Accords. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, Matthias, most people have it in their mind as a violent uprising. And it's because of this extreme disservice that's provided by the media. Now, just now in, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee of all places – I mean, I associate Memphis, Tennessee with very good forms of music. But uh, this, they had a conference on media reform which was attended by several thousands of people. And, uh, I think we're beginning to realize – see, when Allende was overthrown in 1973, there was a journalist in Chile by the name of Ariel Dorfman who asked himself what went wrong. He said Allende was doing all this wonderful stuff. He had nationalized this industry, nationalized that industry, but he failed to nationalize one key industry and that was communications. So through that, it was relatively easy to turn the population against him. Well, you know, they cr crushed the economy. Nixon's famous expression, we're going to make the economy scream, started there. And then when they were weakened, pretty easy to turn them against Allende. And you saw the ecstatic cheering of the crowd for Pinochet because he had brought back a little bit of economic stability. So we're starting to learn how critical this is. And I think that that make a, might make a lot of difference. In fact, this is one of the main things that I'm working on is you know, mass media culture and what we can possibly do about it. Because I think without fixing that, no solution is going to be very permanent. Okay. Um, I would actually like to stop myself at this point if this is okay with you, RB. Would you be willing to come up here and describe what you've been doing? This is going to take a certain amount of nonviolent courage on Arby's part. 
I got incidentally about one fifth of the way into the material I wanted to cover. I hope you found it useful. Perhaps I'll turn my frustration into I tried that once. Don't look at it, don't do this part. Oh, um, should I just start? Or? No, I want you to be on, uh, on I want him to be on record. Ah. Okay, I think I'm good to go. Uh, I'm RB. I'm also a little congested right now, so bear with me. Um, I'm part of the Armenian Student Association, and uh, one of the major events we promote is the United Hands Across Cal. That's basically when um, we try to get everyone together to promote the end of violence and genocide today, uh, and also to focus on the recognition of the Armenian Genocide, which occurred uh, in 1915. Uh, what can I just interject one thing? <laughs> <laughs> Hitler said when he started launching the mm -hmm. genocide against the Jews, he said, who even talks about the Armenian genocide anymore? Mm -hmm. So that was one of his main excuses to do that. Yeah, and that's one of the things we bring up. Like uh, He said, like, who today speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians? So it shows that if we don't recognize genocide of the past, it's just a cycle that's going to continue today. Um, so what I was trying to do actually was um, I wanted to get the Armenian community, uh, community and the Turkish community uh, to have some kind of dial, not a dial, more, more of a, a peace to, to, uh, together at the, in Berkeley rather than continuing this animosity because like, wha like we're talking about um, violence is only going to get more violence. So I figured um, this would be one way to do it. but. Uh, when I brought it up to the Armenian Student Association uh, exec board uh, that I'm a part of, it was met with a lot of opposition. Because like, if I bring it up, the first thing that comes up is, no, you know, the, there's too much going on, you know, and they won't believe it, you know. It's just, it was really bad. <laughs> um, but like, when I talked to them, I, I kind of convinced a little bit of them. It, it's just, the uh, thing I wanted to emphasize was how, how many questions are brought up from it, like, um, do I try to get the Turkish community involved in this, uh, the UHAC, United Hands Across Cal, is that the right event? Um, how do I go about uh, talking to the Turkish community, and how do I go about convincing the Armenian community that this is the way to go? Because like we were saying, if there's a couple people, let's say in the Armenian community or the Turkish community, who are really against this idea, that's going to stand out in, the, in whatever I'm trying to do, you know? Um, Besides that, uh, one, one idea we brought up was to try to get the early adopters um, involved rather than just trying to go all or nothing towards the Turkish community. And when I say early adopters, it's kind of like uh, the like Turkish individuals who are ready to take the next step towards peace, you know? And don't, we don't have to do much in the realm of like convincing them that this is a really good idea, you know? And maybe in a couple years, you know, we get the piece going, mm -hmm. see how that works out. Um, I think there's one thing. Oh, go ahead. Um, this is really interesting because I'm in that international work, and the few Turkish people that I know who are actually in Turkish came last night to see if um, they had said that they were organizing an Armenian and Turkish um, like dialogue. Talk mm -hmm. That oh. we're going to host at our house. Whoa. Um, I think it's, it's March 10th. Yeah. So, so uh, um, it, it's it's on the same idea. I think with with that um, with that it's going to be it's basically a dialogue between Armenian and uh, people from the Armenian and Turkish community here in the Bay Area, and it's basically just so we could start talking again. You know, because um, like especially in, in like from the people I've talked that live in Turkey, there's you're not allowed to talk about this issue. You know. So I think that's really important too to get the dialogue out. And uh, that's about it, I think. Okay, thank you. Thanks. So I'm not going to go through the shirt button ritual again. This, uh, when Arby and I were talking about this this morning, it brought up a number of uh, points that I think are useful for us. One is this question of early adopters. Uh, 
uh, if you ever read Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point. You look out there and there's this monolithic world of like 140 million people watching the Super Bowl. And it looks like there isn't anybody out there who's going to listen to us. And you can sometimes get very demoralized thinking about trying to persuade everybody at once. But you don't have to persuade everybody at once. It never works that way. You find people who are going to pick up the idea and they will have a better t uh, chance of persuading their own networks and people in their own community than you would. See, if, if R.B. as an Armenian goes into the Turkish community and says, you know, come on board with me, there's a suspicion right away. But if he gets a few Turkish individuals within their community carrying that ball for him, then that, then that spreads. So it's a little bit like the great chain of nonviolence. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one more thing that you wanted to bring up. Yeah. Yes, we, we came to a very difficult point. I think I remember this very well now, RBI. I was about one third of the way through my latte when this happened. Uh, there comes a point where you're faced with a choice of making a compromise so you can keep the entire Armenian community intact or going with the people who are on board with you regardless of whether they're Armenian, Turkish or they happen to live in an international house or, or whatever. And it was in this globalizing world of ours, this is becoming an increasingly interesting question that who, whom do we really belong to? Who is our community? And I think we'll end up discovering that we belong to many intersecting communities. And it's a difficult choice to make, but the ch it may just have to be the case that you're going to have to go forward without having the entire Armenian community at your uh, disposal or on board with you. Now, this brings up an organizational form that the Quakers developed, which was very handy. <coughs> You've all, you were all familiar with the term consensus. Um, but they, they, re they uh, it was quite articulate the way the Quakers developed it. For you spend a lot of time trying to get everybody on board with one issue and you, you're able to identify three positions. Okay, RB, I think this is terrific. Now that you've opened my eyes, this is going to be not just for the Armenian community but for the whole world. We're going to serve Armenians by serving others. They w I, I get it. Then there'll be a group that says, I don't get it, but I don't see anything wrong with it. I'm not going to stop you. And then there's going to be a group that says, you bring one Turk in here and I'm out of here. And so these positions are identified recognizably. And the second is called, you know, first is the consensus and then there's the, uh, I think it's, I'm forgetting the terminology. It's something like abstention. I'm not going along with you, but I'm not going to block you. And then there's blocking. So as this thing is going on, we're inventing new organizational forms, new, new methods of democracy that have only been around since the 17th century and so forth. Okay, well that's our time for today. On Tuesday, we're coming into the 21st century with uh, a documentary called Bringing Down a Dictator on the overthrow of Slobodan Milosevic. And again, I think that's kind of long, so try and get here early. And I hope we'll have the other back door fixed by then. <laughs>